All right, well, we've got uh, one more sleep, Kevin Barker, and the regular season gets underway. Um, John Schneider will do a media availability around 3 o'clock today, uh, as will Ross Atkins at 3.30. That's the first media availability of the spring for our man, Ross, since, uh, since he did that group hug at... Uh, in Tampa. So maybe we'll get we'll get a clear idea as to the composition of the Blue Jays roster. There still appear to be some questions uh, as to the final spot on the roster. And of course, officially, the ILs kick in tomorrow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the Jays open the regular season against the Tampa Bay Rays tomorrow at the lovely and scenic Tropicana Field. Um, so as we await John Schneider... Uh, Kevin, I know we talked a little bit yesterday, and we're going. We're, we are going to do our uh, predictions and do some over and unders later on in the show. I know we talked a, a, a little bit yesterday uh, about free agency and about Jordan Montgomery still being out there. Jordan Montgomery is now signed with the Arizona Diamondbacks, and one one of the things I wanted to ask you, okay, we've talked about how the Jays probably didn't do as much in the off season as we wanted. I look at the Yankees, obviously getting Juan Soto. Big. <laughs> Huge. Baltimore, Corbin Burns, they addressed their issues. Got them their opening day starter, but they're still, even the Orioles, they're still a little thin in terms of starting pitchers. Tampa Bay kind of did what Tampa Bay does, and Boston doesn't, doesn't appear to have any pitching. I want to I ask you this. Yes, the Jays did not do a lot this offseason. Do you think that the balance of power or the outlook in the AL East changed dramatically at all. I think we both thought the Orioles were going to be the favorite. The Orioles are the Yankees. Not for um, me. Do you think the balance has changed at all in, in, in terms of what we may have anticipated yeah, I with look, these? Look, I mean, now that Montgomery's off, because a lot of people thought a lot of people thought Boston was slow playing it to get Jordan Montgomery. That clearly clearly wasn't the case. Yeah, I have no idea what Boston's doing. Do you? I don't think the Red Sox now. I think they, I actually think they, you know, they've taken care of their minor league system. Um, they're going to evaluate guys at the major league, major league level. I actually like what Boston is doing, not for this year. They're punted on this year. I mean, I can't put it any other way. They have punted on this year. But given where Baltimore is, given where the Yankees are, it, if, see, if I'm the Red Sox, I'm looking at the division, I'm thinking, okay, Baltimore is going to be good for the next decade. Probably. The Yankees mean, you know, the Yankees haven't won a World Series in a long time. They spent a lot of money during that time. They've had some of the best players in baseball during that time. The Rays, I still think the Rays take a step back. And I'm sure if you're the if you're the Red Sox, you're looking at the Blue Jays and going, in two years, this team could be not not very good. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. They're basically losing everybody in two years. So I get Unlike a lot of people, I completely get what the Red Sox are doing. Yeah, I guess. I mean, if you're if you're a fan of the Red Sox, you have no idea. I mean, they're, they're so used to winning there in New England that what they've done the last couple of years, I mean, they've been atrocious. And, and it doesn't look like it's getting any better. Maybe it is. Maybe they have a plan. Maybe the plan will work out sooner than later. Uh, look, you, you sort of, with the American League East, if Garrett Cole was healthy, you would think, at least for me, I would – think they are the front runner to win the American League East to make a serious run. That's me. Yeah. You could oh, yeah, you could yeah. you could argue the Orioles, the Orioles are gonna take a step back. Like the the sophomore thing is a is a thing, right? Expectations is a big deal when you haven't been through them. Now again, they're very talented and they got, you know, talent coming. More talent to to help out even more. It's look, I, I think you got right now, you got the Orioles at the top, and then you would have the Yankees, the Jays, and the Rays in the middle. If you said the Rays were going to finish second, the Blue Jays would finish fourth, the Yankees would finish third. If you said the Yankees were going to finish second, the the Rays would finish third, the Blue Jays would finish fourth. Like, you could maneuver those three teams around any way you wanted to maneuver them around. Mm -hmm. I, I think right now, first place and fifth place is taken care of. It's the three in the middle that there's a lot of unknowns, right? A lot of it's about health. A lot of it's about, you know, the lineups living up to what people think they could live up to. 
the Rays, do you have any idea? Like, I mean, a lot of that's probably first, rotation and first health. First year, and, Kevin, I don't and, know what to make of it. I, I yeah. swear to God, I don't know what to make Can of the Rays. Can they score runs? Like, what's their plan, right? They always have a plan offensively. Is it trying to hit homers? Is it, yeah. you know, stealing more bases this year? There's different rules that they could use to their advantage. Like, there, I'm sure they'll come up with some way to, to make themselves relevant and give themselves a chance throughout the entire season. But yeah, I don't think so. I think it's sort of cut and dry. It wasn't so much if Garrett Cole was healthy. But right now, for me, it is just Corbin Burns and all the talent and a couple of MVP candidates that the, that the Orioles have. It'd be tough not to say that they're the front runners to win the American League East and, and make a decent run in the playoffs. You know, could you say that they're going to win the World Series? Not me. I think there's better teams. I think the Astros are better. I think the Phillies are better. There's better teams in the National League for me than the Orioles. So, yeah, sure. look, it's, it's, it's going to be – I think it's – there's enough teams at least to make the playoffs fun when it gets here. There uh, was a minor league deal. I didn't say minor league deal. That's not true. There was a three-team deal made uh, earlier today involving the Marlins, the Yankees, and the Rays. And uh, John Birdie, who, if you remember, was basically a career minor leaguer with the Blue Jays and has really put together a nice career for himself. Uh, John Birdie has been traded to the New York Yankees uh, in return the Rays are going to get catcher Ben Rortvet. Uh, and um, that this is, of course, all depending on, uh, depending on medicals. And um, there's a couple of prospects Miami's getting as well. One of them is John Cruz from the New York Yankees. And uh, that deal has not yet been finalized. Um, there's also another prospect, Shane Sasaki. Uh, who is an outfield prospect. We call him prospect. He's a minor leaguer in the race system. Uh, he's going to the Marlins in the deal as well. So it's a minor deal. Ben Rortfett's a guy that uh, that the Yankees had some hope for. I think they got him from Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so he that's a minor deal. Uh, his team's his team set, their, set their rosters. John Birdie, though. I mean, that's, hey, that's, that's an example, man. Yeah, you went to the Marlins. You got an opportunity. Yeah. You, you you take advantage Pay of that your opportunity. Dues. Take uh, advantage of your opportunity. Yeah, I don't know if it's paying paying dues oh. or not. I mean, you get an opportunity. I, you didn't really know what he would turn out to be. Again, again, you got to have playing time. And when you don't get playing time, you're not allowed to show what you can do. And you got to have a little longer leash. Mm -hmm. And you know, fortunately, he got to go to the Marlins and and get that. Made some offensive adjustments. Right. He's he's ambushing some pitches. He can pull the ball in the air. He can hit a home run occasionally. I mean, he can do some, some things defensively. Like, it's a nice little lad. So, yeah, this is what you do, right? If you're a team that's had some injuries and, and are trying to sort of finalize the edges of your team to make it better, to just, you know, it's it's those couple of games. American League East, I told you, those mm -hmm. three teams are bunched together. You could you could say, you could make an argument for all three of those teams. We're, uh, if we're putting the Orioles with the top, the other three teams and the Red Sox at the bottom, the three teams, it would take maybe one little move, one win in April to put that team ahead of the other two teams. So it's interesting. Uh, we're going to be joined later on by Trevor May, former MLB pitcher, co-host of the Rates and Barrels podcast. He's also an MLB network radio host. Uh, he'll be along at the bottom of the hour. We'll talk to him about, oh, we'll look ahead to the season as a former pitcher. I also want to talk to him about, you know, the run we've seen on 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 pitching injuries in baseball, something we talked to uh, Greg Maddox about yesterday. And then we'll give our picks and predictions in the 3 o'clock hour and do some, do some props, do some overs and unders, mm. see how, many, how much stuff we can get wrong. I can't remember what we did last. I think we did pretty well last year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, these things are hard to do. I mean, it's, it's you're trying to predict well. the future. Do I look like a khaki to you? I, yeah. And this is what you're trying to do, right? I mean, again, there's, there's some top-heavy – divisions where it's the obvious choice and in the wild cards there's some teams there you know in, in both leagues there's probably five or six teams you got to choose from to make a wild card spot and make a decent run at it so it's kind of fun to talk about that and that's what the, the that's why adding the couple of teams at the wild card does is it gives it makes those teams that are on the fringe relevant throughout the entire season make the fan base happy you know you're selling more tickets you're looking forward to an entire season when probably you wouldn't if they didn't have as many wild card spots and i think this year you could throw the jays into that there's some a lot of unknowns with the jays right and you know this is what makes it sort of fun talking about the day before the season starts um i asked you yesterday about the uh, who was indispensable uh, on the on on the blue jays we had a little bit of back and forth about 
about Kevin Gossman. And we also obviously talked about the bullpen because we're led to believe that Jordan Romano and Eric Swanson won't, won't be with the team at the start of the year. Is there, is there somebody in this lineup other than Vladdy? Eh, we all assume that if Vladdy has a good year, it can, make a, it can make a real difference. Is there somebody in this lineup that you think is capable of not having a transformational year, but is capable of having the type of year that really elevates the possibility of this team. Yeah, I think we know the first four guys are very important. I think Dalton Varsho, we talked about right. that, right? Hitting the five hole and they'll maneuver him around depending on how he's doing and, and how the team's doing. I think it's the two catchers. I really do. With what's at the bottom go. what's yep. what at the at the bottom of the order, mm-hmm. right? You could have Kiermaier, you could have IKF, you could have Biggio. All three of those could stink at the same time. <laughs> and in the bottom of your order wouldn't be real good. And that would put a lot of emphasis on the first six guys. And maybe the sixth guy sort of booking in it, right? You'd have Springer mm-hmm. and then whoever the catcher is. That's spot is very important because the six hole tends to come up a lot of the times with a lot of traffic on the bases. So having Kirky do things that he was doing in spring training again, spring training is not everything, but it would tell you sort of maybe how the season will sort of, especially the beginning of the season might start for a certain player. Mm -hmm. You know, Kirky's made some adjustments. He looks a little bit better. His bat looks a little bit quicker. He's able to get the pitches. He's hitting the, the breaking ball to right center consistently John at least Schneider in spring training says he, didn't he do looks that all stronger he, I, I don't know stronger. what's that look like I, well i mean he I says he, what that he, looks like. he says he looks stronger. i think he's more grounded i think that's what it is right he's using his legs a little bit more you know they've had to sort of <clears throat> use him a little bit more behind the plate and i think they want to because danny jance is not around enough i can't say it any other way and i don't think that's what's best for kirky might be what's best for the team because he is a good catcher he calls a good game he blocks behind the way the plate the way he's supposed to block. He controls a veteran staff, which is all you can ask for. But then you flip it on the offensive side, and because he's had to do things defensively that probably he wasn't prepared for, they weren't prepared for to basically force him into that, and that made him suffer a little bit offensively. So he just looked a little bit better. Again, it gets back to that. When you watch him hit, and you see the pitches that you think he should be hammering into certain locations or parts of the field, and it actually goes there, then you're starting to think to yourself, at least the things he's doing in the offseason and the things he's been doing in spring training to continually work and get that headed and to continue to stay in that direction is working. He's a big deal. And so will Danny Jansen if he can get back and play. Yeah. I, mean, I want to say 90 games, but, boy, I may be – I may be begging a little bit too much for 90. But say Danny plays 75 games and hits 25 homers or, or close to 25 homers. That's a big deal hitting the six hole. That's more RBIs. It's more runs scored. You win more games that way. Yeah, it's uh, it was kind of funny because we spent a lot of time talking through spring training about different guys in different situations. And, you know, and I've, uh, you know, we had to um, do a piece on sportsnet.ca. All of us had to get together and pick kind of the storyline that we, we think maybe had been underreported or haven't been followed enough. And I say, you know, the, the, the thing that stands out to me is you know, George Springer last year, the healthiest year he's had in, I don't know, five, six years, played more games, statistically his worst year. Now, that's not a good thing when you're an older player and you're healthy and your numbers fall off. And, you know, it didn't, I seem to be the only one that thinks, thought that was the thing. And I, it, we talked a lot about George Springer. The more I thought about it, you know, and I started looking at what Alejandro Kirk has been offensively when he is good and what Danny Jansen can be offensively when he's healthy. And I started looking at that spot in the lineup. I go, that, that, they, they could be difference makers for this team. Yeah, they, it's, they it's, really it's, could. It's, it's being able to make quicker adjustments. I had a ground ball my, my first at bat. I can adjust to that. I don't swing at that. I, I use my feet a little bit more. Like, it just seems he's not a real good at rotating – the, the hips getting off the backside, that's not what he is. He's more of a level it out contact guy, sort of, you know, fillet it to where it needs to go. If he can consistently do that with a dude standing at second, that's what they, that's what they want. That's sort of the theme taken that I was taking away from spring training is the conversation, be yourself and be a tough yourself. If that at bat arises in the third inning with a dude standing at second and 
he got you out on a breaking ball your first at bat, don't let him do it your second at bat. It's that thing, right? Make the adjustment quicker because you have talent. You will help the team win a baseball game. And the longer that lineup is, the better off they will be because there's going to be some hiccups, right? It's just it's a mm -hmm. n normal flow of a season to have some of those. You just want to put the the sort of the lineup together to where they can make adjustments quicker. And you would hope that Danny Jansen gets back. Alejandro Kirk can do that. And Dalton Varsho continues to grow. You're asking for something around the 25 homer mark. He gets Ooh. on base more. He'll steal more bases, that kind of thing, play great defense. And other than that, don't put the ceiling so high that it puts so much pressure on him that say he goes over 10, and then he falls off the cliff, and then he's hitting a buck 70 with runners in scoring position. You don't want that. So just simplify it, and hopefully you see the best out of all these guys because they're going to need it. They need it. The, you see the schedule. We've been talking about this. They got some really good pitching they're about to face. We're going to find out if that thing they've been preaching in spring training and, you know, get something you can do damage on. Well, what's good pitching do to you? They don't give you stuff. Yeah, I just so, – why do I think – that we are really, we're really overplaying the first 10 games of the year. I, uh, I don't know five, if it's five over. And five, five and five is fine. Yeah, look, I, again, it's what they didn't do in the offseason. You just mentioned you started the show with that. Like what they didn't do, yeah, what they didn't that get. Doesn't, that doesn't and, and, mean that even if, you know, even if they'd gone out and gotten, even if they'd gone out and, and got Cody Bellinger, I'd still take five the and five. Expecta the expectation be a little higher. You mentioned how good the Orioles are. I mean, uh, nobody thinks that the Jays are going to win the American League East. Well, Doug Glanville picked them to win the World uh, Series. I mean, that's a good. I mean, every once in a while, it takes that one guy, right? Man, good for Doug. I mean, if that's how he feels. I mean, we got to get Doug so Glanville. Well, it sounds to me like he threw Doug a bunch Glanville of teams on. against the wall, and that's the one. No. He picked. No, he had. He had. He had so he had a lot of things got to go right for that to happen, right? Obviously. So to your point, though, it is. It's interesting when you look at the national writers and 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 the various publications and the various websites. It is interesting when you look at the American League East. The consensus seems to be the Baltimore Orioles. The consensus seems to be that Boston's not going to be that good. And then literally everybody else. I mean, you got people picking, you know, you've got projections projecting the Yankees to finish fourth with argue with one of the worst records yeah. they've had in the last 10 years. You've got projections having the Jays finishing. Fourth. Yeah. What, what, it's really all over what, the place. what if the Red Sox pitching is better? What if they play better defense? Cause we know well, they're, they're going to play, be we know they're going to play better defense. I mean, they got, they got they one have. of the best left-handed hitters in baseball endeavors. Like you, you know, you got something to build around. It's a, it's supporting cast. They're going to score runs. It's uh, how do you keep the other team from scoring? Run prevention. What if they do play better defense? What if the rotation's better than they think it is? Like, and then all of a sudden now you got more competition in the American League East. This is the point mm -hmm. why you need to get off to a good start. Five and five for me. I would think a lot of Jays fans are rolling their eyes to that. I know I will be. Five and five ain't going to be. Again, wow. there it is. Wow. And then you and then you come home and you're facing the Mariners, who got, might might arguably have the best rotation in baseball. No, they don't. Not now they don't. Well, because Wu's missed. You didn't really know what you were going to get anyway. But the first four guys, I mean, that's bringing it. Again, it's about <laughs> it's about consistently doing what you can do to to your fullest. Is there a can team? They do that? Is there a team you think they can beat this year? Because you got you're frightened of the Rays. You're no, frightened of the Astros. That. You're frightened, frightened of the, of the Yankees, and you're frightened of the Mariners. No, there's only there's only one team. In, well, there's a couple of teams in the American League. I mean, it's the Rangers are really good. The Yankees are really good, even without Gary Cole. Uh, the the Astros are the best team for me in the American League, and the Orioles are really good. Like, there's a lot of teams that the Jays are going to have to consistently do some things. That's why you asked me yesterday, who can they? Less afford to go periods of time without. And I mentioned four in the rotation and four in the eight, lineup. Eight guys. That's a collection of people. And I'm stick I'm still sticking with it. And I didn't mention the couple of dudes at the back end of the bullpen. Ten. That now they, they got don't ten have. guys they can. So if, yeah. if they have ten irreplaceable players, they there, must be the best team. They must be the best team in well, baseball. Well, there's some things gotta go right. Okay? Because of how the other teams in the American League are, are sort of stacking up. And again, the Mariners. They're sort of like the Jays. They're a run prevention team who have some head scratching questions about their lineup. What if Ty France shows up and it's Ty have, France a couple of years ago? They don't have Matt now Brash. You're, now they your lineup's a little different. Like it's, they don't have. Uh, I, I, I'm saying, like you got it's yeah. the windows open there for you to play good consistently. If you're going to get beat, have the other team beat you. Don't beat yourself. If they do that because they have talent, they should be okay.
if they can consistently look like Vladdy getting picked off at second, that's what you remember last year at the end of the season, right? That's One of the all things most I remember. fans remember is him getting picked off. I also remember Stay Kikuchi away coming that. into the bullpen. That didn't help either. Anyhow. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just, I, if they come back five and five, I'm, I'm certainly. Well, the season's not over, but I would still like to, to, I would like to see them translating on the field against good teams on the road with wins. Five and five just tells me oh, it's the same old Blue Jays offensively. That's, that's why I want to see it. Like, I want to see what they're preaching to everybody actually translate. What's six and four ain't a, too much to ask. Seven and three might be. Six and four is not. I think five and five is just fine. There you go. Hold serve. You come home. You got the Mariners. Yeah, good luck. Ooh, well, they don't the like they don't like hitting at home anyway. So, well, we don't know. Maybe, well, there you the, go. maybe, maybe the ballparks maybe. change. Maybe it's changed. Maybe. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I just uh, I I every 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 time everything I read everything I hear is the guy get off the hot start. They, well, well, no crap, Sherlock. Everybody needs to get off. You know what's good? Nine and one is good. Okay, it's the, great to get off to a hot uh, start. Do- but we're, Dodgers, we're really hanging a lot in these the, 10 the games. The Braves Come and on. the Dodgers could afford to get off to slow starts. You're telling me in the American League East that the Blue Jays, and the way the American League is, and probably yeah. you're going to have to win 89 games to make the playoffs, that you could get off to a slow start? Yeah, it'd be tough. If they're a bunch and, and the if, way, you know, the way we're hearing behind the scenes that it, whoa, the clubhouse, how we fix it? Like, uh, it's fixed now. So, I'm, so I've been told. But that's the thing, right? Is. You just fingers crossed, hope that everything sort of comes together and they throw in strike one, be efficient, run the bases the way you're supposed to run them, and get an occasional big-time hit. That's what you need to do. Don't have to do it all the time. An occasional one. Ten games. Well, you could add the, the ones games. at home, too. What if what if there are three teams in the AL East that are five and five? I, I just, I... Every year, it's the, every year, it's the same thing. Every year... I mean, there are common storylines. And every year, we got to get off the hot start. Not really. Yeah, no, no. The not, la- really. not for me. The last couple of years, I mean, they were in the conversation of winning a World Series. That that would mean you could, so you you could, could sort you could of lean on. Start. Well, you could lean on some things because you have talent and experience. And, you know, I, we can overcome that. Eh. You, think, you, think, you think mentally and offensively they could overcome that? I'm not saying that five and five is the, the, the end of the season, but I'm saying that I think confidence-wise, it would be nice for them to come home six and four. That's all. Uh, we are going to give our picks in the three o'clock I am hour. picking the Jays to make the playoffs. I know that. you are. I, I, I know you are because you were scared not to. Absolutely not. They play really good defense. They pitch really well. And their bullpen's really no, you're good. You're like me. healthy. You're like how, do you me. Not, how do you not pick them? You're like me. I mean, I was not going to pick them. But I thought, yeah, I might as well. I've, I felt, I feel optimistic. I feel optimistic. But we'll deal with our yeah. uh, our picks and our uh, our individual individual winners uh, later as well. And as we mentioned, John Schneider and Ross Atkins are doing media availabilities at three o'clock. It is a workout day for the Blue Jays at Tropicana Field. We are awaiting. I mean, I don't think they have to give us the the actual roster, if I'm not mistaken, until tomorrow at noon. That's normally what it is on the postseason. I could be wrong. But uh, we'll get a better sense today, I would think, from the Blue Jays. I mean, there seems to be, you know, Yariel Rodriguez, we're led to believe, is going to start the year in the minors. Yeah. There seems to be some question about the, 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 the tail end of the bullpen. And frankly, we still really don't know the extent of the injury to Jordan Romano uh, or Eric Swanson. We were kind of led to believe Eric Swanson was a little further ahead than Romano, just reading into... Yeah. Into what into what uh, John th- Schneider had said. I think what you're saying, if Wes Parsons makes it makes the team, it'd be nice for John to tell us why that is. That's all. We shall see. Yeah. We shall see. Trevor May is a former MLB pitcher. He's co-host of the Rates and Barrels podcast. He's an MLB network radio host as well. He'll join us next. It's Blair and Barker on Sportsnet 590, the fan and Sportsnet. All right. Well, our job just got a little easier. Uh, we are going to be carrying John Schneider and Ross Atkins' media availability live from Tropicana Field at uh, 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock for John Schneider, 3.30 for Ross Atkins. And uh, that'll give us a you know, better idea, hopefully, of the final composition of the roster in addition to getting... I mean, I guess the thing we're kind of waiting on right now is... is what did Kevin Gossman say yesterday? I mean, we're 
you know, we haven't heard anything. Nothing's leaked out or anything. But I guess that's kind of the the one outstanding thing, Kevin. Yeah, I guess. In terms look, of health. Yeah, yeah. Look, that's, you know, that's first and foremost, I believe. I, I, I just wonder how they're going to handle the, the, the last two spots in the bullpen. I mean, we've, we've heard Parsons, which I... Does that make any well, sense? We, I mean, I, they're worried about innings. I'm assu- I would assume that would be the case. That's why I'm interested in hearing. I would assume whoever's there will be asking that. The first question is, you know, how you how you figuring out who's going to start and what, who will help you the most to begin the season, those last two spots in the pen. So, yeah, those those two spots. And then Gosman's a big deal. And, and you know, when is he when is he pitching? Yeah. Yeah. No, that is the uh, that is the big question, and uh, and we will find out. I said three o'clock. We'll carry the manager's availability live from Tropicana Field, and three thirty Ross Atkins media availability live from Tropicana Field. Uh, let's go to Trevor May. He's a former MLB pitcher. He's co-host of the Rates and Barrels podcast, MLB Network radio host. You can follow him on Twitter at I am Trevor May. Trevor, thanks for joining us today. How you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Uh want to get some of your takes on your picks on the divisions and individual uh individual awards i uh saw your your youtube picks um but before that we had greg maddox on yesterday and i'm and one thing we've been talking about this year and it's particular to the uh to to the blue jays with uh jordan romano and eric swanson hurt and you know kevin gossman we think that he's that he's been given the all clear um, as a former pitcher, like every year, it seems to me that we go, oh my God, I can't believe there's so many pitching injuries. And then the next year we go, this has got to be the most pitching injuries I've ever seen. And then the year after that, we go, it's the most pitching injuries I've ever, is there something going on here? Is it, are, are pitchers getting hurt in your mind now more than ever? And, and why do you think that is? It sure feels like that. Um, and it is hard to tell if it's like a recency bias thing or not. Um, I hear that a lot. It's funny because it's one of those things that there's actual numbers of, and it should be pretty easy to look up. It requires work, though. <laughs> yeah, the, the, but, like, no, there's no aggregate number anywhere that's, like, because of the na- nature of the injuries, and they're all different. Right. Um, and they come from different reasons. So how do you group those things? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean to go full data science on you there at the beginning, but uh, that, that's something I've searched for, and I can't really find. Um, but I, I, I'd say that that's not un, unfounded for sure. There's definitely something going on. It's actually... Uh, a guy who made a great point about it and, and made some some valid uh, arguments was, you know, Chris Bassett. Mm-hmm. Uh, talking mm-hmm. about guys trying to throw as hard as they can, and that's being um, that's being incentivized. Uh, you know, our game has always been incentivized to get good at certain things. Uh, a lot of that is driven by, you know, free agency or what's going to keep you in the big leagues or, or what's going to get you there. Um, and depends on where you are in your career and how you prioritize what you're trying to get better at. Um, but lately, it's because of the way science and technology has come along is we know a lot about how you make your pitches move the most and how to throw the hardest. And uh, if you're not doing that, everyone else is, is doing that. So if you're not doing that, you're not doing everything you can to uh, have the best career you can. And that's just a non-starter for a professional athlete. So I think we're seeing guys just taking the chances, like chances are being taken that maybe weren't being taken in the past because the payoff could be potentially huge. It's all, it it has always kind of surprised me that, We've come so far in analytics. I don't want to get into an analytics debate here at all, but we've come so far in analytics, and you hit in something that I don't think fans and even some members of the media keep in mind. Guys do this. Guys want to get paid for what they do. And and I, I look at the arbitration system where basically you're using old school stats to convince people. And I it just strikes me as as odd that that we use analytics for everything. But when it comes time to determine how much money Kevin Barker or Trevor May are going to get paid in arbitration, we're going back to the old numbers for the mm. most part. For the most part, we're going back to the old numbers. I don't, I don't know if that's ever going to change. I don't know if that's ever going to change. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it will either. Um, you got to remember, though, now we're talking directly about uh, where we are at a, basically the end of a journey where there's going to be money given at the end. <laughs> and mm. you're right there. Yeah. And when that happens, uh, you know, we use a lot of uh, – I could talk a lot about arbitration, how silly it is in a lot of ways. Um, Please do. Is. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of, it's, it's, it's a goofy system. And at the end of the day, it's someone's making a decision that a lot of times isn't very well read on baseball. Uh, mm-hmm. They're a professional lawyer uh, or an arbitrator. So uh, it's that by itself. Like if we're arguing stats and the person that is supposed to make the decision doesn't understand stats, what are we doing here? 
Um, and that happens more often than not, frankly. Uh, so it, it comes down to this, what stats fit your argument best? So we, we're seeing a lot of players making the analytics arguments and then teams making the non-analytics arguments, unless the analytics were worse and then the team suddenly cares about the analytics. So it's, we're coming down to negotiating pay. It's less about the actual nuts and bolts of the, the arguments being made and just how you make them. And that's just kind of how law works. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, it's silly, but I don't know if that's going to change in any really meaningful way. I think slowly over time, it's just like anything else. You got to make set precedence. So as soon as a team accepts some number as something that matters, then suddenly now other teams in the future are going to have to do that. Like that, that argument's valid now. And that's just how this, the system works. But it's turned into this. It's just always going to be behind the game and how on-field decisions are made. It's going to be a few years behind because um, the team wants to pay less money and the player usually wants more money. So mm -hmm. uh, whatever gets you to that end goal, the the, the best um, in an arbitrator's eyes is is the way to go. And I don't think that's the best way to manage these things. So arbitration is a little bit silly in that way. You're you're totally right. Trevor, we, we had Greg Maddox on uh, yesterday, and he was talking about he wants to throw just hard enough. And, and it got me thinking about opening day and, and you know, how you sort of work into a season. You want to stay healthy all season, right? You don't want to blow it all out the first week of the season. And I was fortunate enough to make a, a team out of spring training. The heart rate goes up. It's just different, right? When you're standing on the yeah. line and you've made a team out of spring training, it's harder to control everything around you, right? It's, it's part of it, how, how you yeah. – sort of go about trying to do that. How long did it take you to sort of just fall into, I got to make a good pitch here. I don't want to overthrow. You know, there's a lot of things that come into that. Weather, hitters not ready. You know, you just, you could sort of get them out easier early in the season than you could say middle of the season, late in the season, right? Everybody's sort yeah. of trying to get their feet wet and that kind of thing. How hard is that to do as a pitcher knowing that, you know, this time of the year you could get away with a hanging breaking ball or you could get away with a missing, trying to go up and maybe leave one down the middle. Is that tough to do this early in the season? Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's the, it kind of bleeds over from spring training because it's the same way you're trying to work on things. But you also don't want to be like, you know, especially early in the year and you're like the, a back-end bullpen guy and you're throwing in the fourth inning after the starter <laughs> and you're facing some guy, a lot of, a lot of guys with their numbers in the 90s with no name on the back. Yep. It's hard to like... First of all, I couldn't like game plan at all, which is a big part. Like I want to know a little bit. So not knowing anything about a guy is just like a foreign thing to me. So then I had have to be like, okay, now what am I working on? Uh, and how can I, should I just only throw sliders? Cause I want to work on throwing it in the zone and then moving it out of the zone. Like I had to have something specifically like that. And then one day now you can't just do that. Mm -hmm. You have to get the guy out. You have to, it doesn't matter how you do it. And so um, it's almost like be, being aware of no, like what might it might take to get someone out. Like you said, pitchers always have the advantage early in the year, usually because it's older as guys haven't had as many at bats. So it takes a little bit longer to get going that way. And pitchers just have an advantage. Um, and then as the year goes on, it's harder and harder to, or it gets more even. And then it kind of, everyone's kind of parallel to each other. And so you, you, you have to find, you got to like take it with a grain of salt and, and analyze yourself only and not the results and then that will help you the best that's very 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 hard to do because it's especially when you're young you don't have much experience it's exciting because you're being successful but how many times have we seen a young guy come up first april rush it and then suddenly wheels fall off and they can't find those wheels again mm. um it happens really really often um and that's kind of the dynamic you're talking about so uh it took me you know, it took me probably till like I came back from Tommy John. It took me four years probably yeah. uh, to really just like be like, this is just who what is happening right now. And uh, but just know that there's still going to be things you need to work on, even if you're being successful right yeah. now in April. Trevor, through your career, you you filled a number of roles, and and you know we've kind of all, we always focus on the guys at the back end of the bullpen. We focus on the starters. You know, one of the sort of storylines we're following with the Blue Jays right now is the actual composition of the the final three bullpen spots. It's up in the air. Um, when you are one of those guys, when you are one of those guys where you're sort of you're waiting to find out what your role is on a team, how difficult is that at at the end of spring training, going into a regular season? Kind of, you know, I'm on the team, but I sort of kind of don't know whether. They want me for length or, or when I'm going to be used. Am I going to be a spot starter? Am I going to be an opener? I don't know. How, how difficult is that for guys mentally? 
I think it's extremely difficult, especially for the guys who are like starters their whole careers. And they're like, hey, we're going to bring you to the big league team, but you're going to be the long guy uh, to start the year. And they haven't given up on that dream of being a starter yet. Right. Like they still probably could be a starter. There's just no spot. That's probably the hardest thing to do, I think, as a reliever, um, because you really don't know. You don't know. You know, you don't know what guys you haven't established, like what young guys are going to be pulled really fast or if a, a veteran guy's going to struggle, but they're going to let him go. And you're like preparing, but you're not going to go in. Like, it's really, really tough to do. And especially if you don't have a lot of experience either. So if it's, especially if you're a rookie, like you're like, I really don't know what to do. This is something I've never done before. And I think that's the hardest. I think that not having a role, though, especially, if, for example, let's take uh, three guys waiting. They know they're going to be like the number six, seven and eight out of the bullpen, probably. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of figure it out by process of elimination. Like, you know what the other five guys are probably going to be doing. You know, you know, you know, uh, uh, um, Mesa is probably going to face lefties. Uh, you know, you know, your closer is, you, you know, like usually teams know these things. So you're like, okay, well, I don't have to worry about closing. Uh, he's a set of guys. So I don't have to worry about throwing the A. So that leaves these innings. Uh, and I'm probably those guys. Um, I might be the guy that throws when we're behind because they don't really know. That's, that's where you start. You usually mm -hmm. start there. That's the, that's the dirty job. Right. The easy eater. We're behind. Just keep us kind of close, please. Um, but if you struggle, it's okay to struggle. It's more okay to struggle now than right. in other bigger spots. Um, and that's kind of how I did it. I was like, okay, these guys have these roles. So I'm probably in one of the other ones. And then just got to play it by ear for a couple of weeks and see where <laughs> you're at. Um, especially in April, because there's no starter throwing one five mm -hmm. at least for the first station through. Uh, and so relievers throw a lot at the beginning too. So it's pretty easy to figure it out. Actually. Um, it gets easier because a lot of reliever levers are throwing for pretty much every team. Um, and you can establish yourself that way. But, uh, yeah, I would say that swing role is far and away the hardest thing to do. Trevor, with teams on the bubble like the Blue Jays, me and Jeff had a mini argument about he thinks five and five on a road trip's okay. I I think because of the way offensively they looked last year, the the rumblings of, you know, it's a different approach, you know, swing at what you can do damage on. And then if you say that and then you go on the road and you go five and five, it sort of sends that like, you know, sort of same old Blue Jays, right? Offensively, they're going to have to grind out an entire season, but six and four just feels different. Do you think that's the case? Like, am I overthinking this, that the first 10 games of the season really don't mean anything? Say and yes. if, they are, they, if they're 500, that's okay. They'll, they'll move on and they'll figure it out from there. Or six and four would be a great thing and you could gain momentum from that. I, uh, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit more in your direction. Nice. Uh, I think it, the just the mindset of maybe the fan base and yeah. the people watching. Yeah. Six and four is a huge, way more different than five and five, especially with how the season ended last year. Mm -hmm. Especially when you know there was a lot of like, ah, if we could just do this one thing, like we could separate ourselves a little bit, and that just never happened. Or some injury would happen, or some another starter would go down, and you'd have two starting pitchers at that point. Like, geez, we were so close. Um, we'd have a really good road trip, and then come home and go like three and six. And you're like, well. That's undone, and we're 500 again. <laughs> uh, so I think that starting strong, especially on the road, especially in a three city, it's a three city trip. I'm not, I'm not actually, I don't yeah. know what the schedule is, but if they start on a three city trip to start the year, and you can go six and four, yeah. that's a tough trip to it start is. the year with. Mm -hmm. You can do six and four there. You're, you should be, feel really good about that, especially if you come back with the team intact and everyone, you know, for the most part, everyone's feeling good, and 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 you can go smoothly into that home opener. That's, I think, that's a big big deal for not only the fan base, actually the, the team too. You feel good about it because that's a big step, no matter when it is in the season. If you do it well at the beginning of the year, I think that's a, a hopeful thing for the awesome. for how the rest of your might. So right, Jeff, I'll, I'll wave the white flag. <laughs> I'll wave the white flag. So I, I, I saw that you picked, I, I think you picked Gunnar Henderson as World Series MVP, which suggests to me that you think the Baltimore Orioles are going to win the American League. Um, and you're certainly, you're certainly not the, the only person to make that pick. How do you see the East shaping up right now? Um, when I made that video, by the way, guys, if you ever want to make a YouTube video making predictions for a season, uh, just do it one day because if you wait for information, it is just <laughs> the hardest thing on the planet to do. <laughs> so uh, make sure you record it in one day and then release it the next day because things change so fast. Yeah. Uh, that was a nightmare. Um, so I made that video. I had the uh, the Orioles taken first. This was right after they they signed or they uh, traded for Burns. Right. So I I was think they I thought they were missing their their true ace. I Bradish is great, but uh, he I mean he doesn't have the experience that they have arms. That's I think that's pretty clear. But they didn't have the guy, uh, and he's the guy now. Now they have a guy. The the game one Garrett Cole game one you know like whoever it is in their division because everyone's got an ace. Mm -hmm. uh, you want him matched up. So I think that changed them a little bit. They got such good 
young talent. Um, I'm just a huge fan of like Adley Rushman. I think that that kid is going to be a Buster Posey type uh, leader and, uh, and he just has it all. So like, they're just an impressive team after playing them last year too. There's just not a lot of holes in that lineup. So I had them taken first, but I, I also am a believer that Rodone takes, he, he flips the coin again and he has another Rodone year. Um, I think he's going to be much, much, much better, much more valuable than he was last year. But this was before Garrett Cole went down. So I had the Yankees hanging around with him. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the case now. Um, I think it's a lot more, a lot closer in the middle, middle three teams, uh, you know, with the, with the Rays, with you guys and with, uh, with the Yankees. I, I, it's it's like a three sided coin for me, a little bit at this point. Maybe with the ad- advantage going to the Yankees there, um, and you never know with the Rays. Uh, they got rid of Glass now, but they they seem to just like appear constantly with that team. Like you you could just give me a list of guys I've never heard of. I'm like, well, they're probably all good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, oh, that guy's in the bullpen. I bet you he's got a great slider. Yeah, uh, there's probably a really good chance. Um, so I never count them out because I think it's stupid to do that. But it's hard to point to anything specific. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's really open in that way. But I think the Orioles are probably the most complete team at the moment, um, which is crazy to say because their average age is like 22 years old. But they're they're a really good team. They added some depth pieces of some older guys uh, like Kimber out in the pen. I think is going to be big, even if it's not him throwing the ball. Uh, and getting the big outs all the time, I think he's going to help the young guys with experience. So uh, I'm still pretty high on the Orioles. I think they're a pretty complete team. But I think that wild card spots in the AL are pretty wide open. The Central mm-hmm. still the Central. They're going to have one team that makes the playoffs. Um, they're all going to be like 500 all year. Uh, and the West is, you know, who knows who knows what happens with the with the top two there, and then and the Mariners. Like I think that it's between the East and the West for. Or who who produces all of the wild card teams uh, this year? So it's gonna be a lot of fun to watch. But I got the Red Sox kind of just hanging out in the bottom there. I don't think they have any illusions that it's gonna be a gonna be a successful season after losing Giolito. That was the only guy they signed, and then they lost him. Um, yeah, it's it's not not great in Boston. Yeah. Uh, is there a uh, team that you think maybe people are too high on in the American League or National League? Team people are too high on. Um, or overselling, I guess, is how I would put it. Maybe you think Honestly, the Braves could take a step back. Maybe that was one. I, I'd say that's might be the most likely thing. The thing yeah. about it is, I mean, I think the I think there is no way to uh be the correct amount of high on the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. I think everyone just by 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 the way that they by their offseason, people are just gonna be there's just no way to live up to those expectations. You could win the World Series. They gotta win every game to live up to those expectations at this point. So uh, that's going to be a disappointment in some way, somewhere. It's just going to be. So maybe that's my my call there. Um, but I think that a lot of teams got better than they originally thought. Uh, I think that's more of the narrative. Um, I think like the Tigers are a better team mm-hmm. than people are giving them credit for. I After playing against them towards the end of the year last year when they were like kind of coming together, I was like, this is a pretty good team. They got some good pitchers. They added really good players. I think the Tigers have a chance to win their division. People... Yell at me for that, but I I genuinely believe that. Um, another team I think that on the other side and the other uh, the national side is the Reds. Um, yeah. I think they're exciting. I'm really excited about them. I think signing signing Sunny Gray was huge. They got some electricity in that that uh, rotation. Like that's a rotation that they all click. Like you're like this might be the best stuff wise in the they could they could be they have that potential. So those are the two teams that I got kind of like outside the box on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know. This is one of my teams. Maybe, maybe the Twins fans are a little too high, mm-hmm. just a little bit, um, because there's a couple of things that they're counting on happening that haven't happened yet. Byron uh, Buxton like, staying healthy. <laughs> Buxton and Royce Lewis, yes. Yeah. Uh, giving you, giving you like 140 games. Yeah. If they do though, mm. now they're way better than people thought. So it's just, I, I love those guys. I know them personally. They're friends of mine, and they're absolute amazing athletes. And I would love more than anything to see them play day in and day out with any injuries not even being mentioned that would be phenomenal for baseball and for that team but yeah maybe that needs to happen though we need to see it happen first yeah trevor really good of you to join us thanks so much man great insight thanks buddy of course thanks guys take care trevor may former mlb pitcher uh co-host of the rates and barrels podcast mlb network radio host and he agreed with me about the uh about the uh 10 games i think no he didn't I thought he said it, it, five and five. He was, no, he was no, no, no. It, it, it's again, it's again. When when you don't do what you 
thought you should have done in the offseason. I do get the point. And now you're talking about the way you're talking about the core, and, and you usually don't say that about the core if they were really good last year. <laughs> now you're saying they need to make up for some things and they need to carry their load. That's basically what this comes around to, and they're trying to do it with a sort of a different approach, right? Take the thing you can't do damage on. Are they capable of doing that? That's the thing you got to ask yourself, and you sort of need to see it. Like, you need to see the light at the end of the tunnel, mm. and for me... It's a giant difference between five and five or six and four. Maybe I'm reading too much into no, it. No, listen, I it think for a different feel to it. I, I, I will say this. I think for the fan base, if they if they come back and they're six and four, um, yeah, because I, I don't – I'm trying to figure out how to put this delicately. I don't think same old, same old is going to excite people this year. I, I don't think – Five and five, five hundred. Yeah, yeah quite the a Blue few. Jays. What you're saying is, that quite a few three and thirteens with runners in scoring position ain't going to do it, right? Bingo. You need to see better of that. Bingo. So, yeah, that's all. Like I, I know it's only one game, but you just sort of need to see the step forward. And I, I just think it would be easier for them, for fans of the Jays, not to sort of say on the bubble of flip flopping like the Mariners and the Blue Jays all of a sudden after <laughs> ten games. I'm not saying that would happen. I think it's going to be that type be, of year. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I, sure it will I really be. Really do. Because they're sort of the same kind of team. But I think that's what makes it fun. So that's why you tune in to watch baseball is there's sort of a lot of teams that have the same problem. It's just which team can fix it quicker and maintain it an entire season. And ultimately will, will be the end. Because most of the teams are smart enough with their khakis to figure out run prevention and who mm -hmm. they're using in the right spot of the pen and with power and that thing. It's the offensive side. So hopefully they figure it out. And it's, it's more fun if more teams are in it. So the Jays will start their regular season tomorrow. It'll be 4 o'clock first pitch. We'll be on right up to first pitch on uh, Sportsnet 360. We'll be on the main channels up until Blue Jays uh, Central at 3 o'clock. And then Kevin and myself will be doing Blue Jays talk immediately following the game tomorrow. Uh, again, 4 o'clock first pitch. The Jays opener. They've got 4 against Tampa, 3 against Houston, 3 in the Bronx against the Yankees. Um, no Garrett Cole, no Justin Verlin. I mean, Houston's got a ton of pitching injuries. I, I think I'm, I can say this. Uh, Wes Parsons made the team, Mitch White made the team, and Nate Pearson made the team. They all have made the team. They have all made the team. So the, the Wes Parsons thing is intriguing. It's length. Probably length. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the unknown of what they're not going to get with their innings in the rotation, right? Yeah. They've got an older rotation. So Zach, the oldest. Zach Pop was kind of the guy that we thought and, and, was and, on the bubble. And the Little. Bubble. Little was the guy, Pop. too, that were sort of, you did, yeah. do you take three lefties? Do you need a righty that you really don't know how to use, right? Can you get a lefty out? Zach Pop, they, there, there's some unknowns there. Maybe Parsons, they like what they saw in spring training. So, yeah, it's with those three guys, you know, you hopefully don't have to abuse them. And I think the Parsons thing just sounds like with White that it's sort of right. You can match up against the right team. Maybe you can give your your offense and your yeah. team a chance to win. Zach, I just want Zach Pop to go down and just go down and close out games at AAA. Uh, I don't know. That's all I, want. I want to see if he can do it. I think it's sort of what they are. Like, like he is sort of what he is, right? Can you get a lefty out? Yeah. That's all I care about. Can Anyhow, so we haven't uh, seen it. We will, uh, we will be joining John Schneider's news conference at 3 o'clock. He is doing his media availability at Tropicana Field. And uh, we'll get a sense from John at that point, obviously, on where the, uh, where the roster sits. Ross Atkins will be along at 3.30. It'll be his first media availability, I believe. First full media availability in, in, in a while. Um, so we'll look forward to that. That'll be it. That'll be it. <laughs> what? Why are you looking at it like that? Well, because <laughs> you, you gave me that, you gave me the stink eye. At uh, we'll Rather do that from at Bo. We're glad we'll do that. At, <laughs> stop it. We'll do that at three thirty. <laughs> Can and, I say that? Uh, <laughs> you just see. You know what? You just. Ah, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> and we will make our picks. You were thinking and it. I just Stop said it. it. That's and we all. <laughs> be quiet. And we will make our picks uh, and predictions. Don't go anywhere. Because you never know what the hell can happen here, and you sure don't know what's going to be said. It's Blair and Barker on Sportsnet 590, the fat at Sportsnet. Uh, I might wear a tie tomorrow. Go for it. I might wear a shirt and tie.
I think we should. I, I think we should have days where we where we don't tell me where we do. dress up. A bit. Enough people tell me what to do. I, I, I'm yeah, good. you really don't. That's yeah, true. I'm good. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I I'm, apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> I mean, we used to wear. I all, like my shirts. I wear opening day. We used to it used to be a thing to wear a shirt and tie. It's the home day. opener. You show up. You wear your sports jacket. Everybody says nice jacket. And nice, they throw it away. Nice shoes. Yeah. And then they never see them again. <laughs> that is that is very <laughs> like, that, that is huh? that is very true. That's, That's it. Funny how that works, isn't it? It is. Right? It is Blair and Barker. It is the second hour. Is this the second day we've done two hours? Right. Yeah, Boy, second day good. we've done two hours. Uh, we'll be on from two to four tomorrow, right up to first pitch on three sixty, uh, and uh, we'll be on from two to three on the other Sportsnet channels, and then we'll be doing Blue Jays talk following the game. Mm. John Schneider's the manager of the Blue Jays. He's talking to the media at Tropicana Field. You'd much rather hear from him than us. So here we go. Um, I think you're looking at it, you know, kind of like uh, how our starters are going to be rolled out, you know, innings we need to cover, um, how they're throwing the ball, obviously, and what's best for everybody. So with Yariel, I think just building him up consistently, um, having a pretty, you know, set plan with him, and um, we want a lot of his innings to be with us and to be, you know, 100% when he is with us. And then with Zach in comparison, uh, comparison to Wes or Nate, um, a little bit more length with the other guys. And then we got Mitch here, too, that can provide that. But I think the first couple times through mm -hmm. our starting rotation, there's going to be some innings to cover. So that, in a combination with how they're throwing the ball, um, that's how we landed. Uh, for someone like Wes, who hasn't made an opening date uh, since 2019, um, do you appreciate how much he's grinded to have both KBO, back surgery, and all that to get to where he is today? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we had such a quick look at him last year in game 162 and then um i think watching him this spring and kind of how he came in how his stuff was playing um yeah you, you like having those conversations there's a lot of tough conversations you know at the end of camp and uh, that was one of the better ones yeah for sure uh yeah more of the same, really. They're still throwing and kind of building up. Um, they're over at the PDC. You'll probably see them here this weekend, but um, nothing really new to report for those two guys. They're still still going. Mm -hmm. nope. uh, what about Alec? What's, uh, what's, uh, he, um, he pitched today over at the PDC in a two-inning sim game, 34 pitches. Um, likely IL to serve the year for him. Um, I don't know if that's actually set in stone yet, but uh, wanting him to build up, you know, so I think you look at today and then from today, assuming all goes well, uh, next time out, you know, add on some more pitches and then um, hopefully have a more competitive game tomorrow. Not sure yet. Um, you know, he's here, he's feeling good. Everything was good after he pitched in Bradenton and then yesterday into today. Uh, so we'll kind of have that figured out um, in the next day or two. Could be Sunday. Could be Sunday or Monday. Yeah. No, first three are the same. Yeah. It, or is it Bassett then? Yeah, Jose Bassett. Yeah. What are some of the debates on which days for God? Is it related to performance elsewhere, or is it something about him physically that needs to be? Yeah, yeah, you want Kevin out there as much as you can, obviously, um, for one. And I think um, days of rest come into it, too. You don't want to have too many, but I think having a couple extra is, is a good thing. And, um, you know, just overall performance, really. You know, it's not like you're going to shy away from from Kev versus anybody. Uh, but if we can if we can line him up, um, you know, the best possible way for him and then include, you know, a good matchup versus a, a division opponent, that's, that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Really a dodge to one of them a little bit and that, you know, really just <laughs> that's a start or two from the way for him to pull on. Yeah, uh, yeah, happy with the way it's gone, for sure, the last couple of weeks with him. And uh, knowing that there was nothing really wrong, you know, the whole time was really comforting. And seeing him kind of progress the last 10 days has been really good. Yeah. You're holding breath for a while. What about your lineup? Have you decided on the lineup and what do you want to do with decisions for the lineup? Uh, yeah, pretty set on the lineup. I think uh, you're trying to just put guys in spots where they're not going to have to change who they are and what makes them great and um, hopefully make it a little bit tougher for opposing teams or starters to, to match up against. Um, so that being said, we like to keep it pretty consistent. I think what you saw at the end of camp is what you'll see. Only George, Vlad, Bo in that order with JT behind him. And um, and then kind of go from there. Um, but it was nice to kind of roll out a lot of the regulars for you know, the last 
possibly could have or so. Was that by design that they played more consistently at the end of the spring? Yeah, just with, you know, opening up here and then having three days off, you know, it's, it's a little bit weird, or two, just whatever it is, Tuesday, Wednesday off. Um, yeah, you want to kind of build, it's a fine line between building them up and getting them ready, and then also not getting them, you know, in harm's way at the end of camp. So, tried to keep them together as much as possible, yeah. So, what to, you know, we've talked about this a few different times, but what sort of tip the scales right now for flat between uh, uh, um, I mean, it's just not like a magic equation, you know. Um, I just think the way they're all swinging the bat and how they kind of play off one another and their skill sets and what they do with guys on base and things like that. If they're, if they're doing what they're supposed to do and what we've known of them for their whole career, you know, they're all hitting with guys on base. So it's really kind of when that spot comes around again uh, with what the other part of the order has done. And then hopefully George is hitting with guys on and, and Vlad and Bowen on down the road. But I think it's just... Um, at the very least, it kind of just, you know, splits up specific skill sets, really. But, again, you know, it's not set in stone. You know, you want to be specific with it, but um, there's no real, okay, this is going to 100% work. You know, it's just be like the way it uh, rolls out. George and Bo can be kind of free swingers. Do you like the idea of having Vlad in between them as a guy who can maybe take a more pitches? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, if again, if we're, if we're going to see the Vlad that we've seen in the past when he's really good and, and in spring training, yeah. For sure, and again, you don't want to tell guys. The last thing I want to tell both the shed is don't swing. You know what I mean? I think I want to tell him to swing. I don't want there to be guys on base. So a lot of it is just trying to find, you know, your best players um, at the plate when they're really good. And I think Bo is really good, um, one of the best in the league when guys are on base. And I just said, go ahead. Both of them, I mean, they look great, you know. Um, again, results aside, I think the pitches they're swinging at um, in spring training were, were great. I know they're really confident. They've had great off seasons and great camps. So uh, you feel really good about those guys. You know, it's it's obviously a big part of our team. Um, but love where they're both at. Is the ninth inning uh, by committee situation in the short Probably. I mean, I think to start, you can look at, at Yimmy and Chad to kind of be pushed back into a, la a later inning or two. Um, and then, you know, Cabrera, Meza, kind of after that. But depending on lineups, you know, things like that, it's we got, we got options still. Obviously, two guys that you're used to having back there, not there to start, but it's an opportunity for other guys to really step up and love the way they're both throwing the ball. Um, and I think the biggest thing is it's going to be opportunities for guys that may not have been in those spots out of the shoot, getting those right away. How did they show you this Stuff. Um, Stuff was there, which was a big thing for him, not kind of hit or miss with his stuff. Velo was there, Slider was there, um, and executed at a better level. You know, I know last year we talked about two out of the first three pitches for strikes, and um, for the most part, we saw a lot of that this year. Biggest difference with Nate is just his mentality, you know, understanding that he needs to take another step forward. Adding a split, I think, will, will help him against left-handed hitters. And, um, you know, just I love where his mentality is right now to where, okay, it's time for me to really uh, go and use my ability and, and stay up here. Does Chad's last appearance against Philadelphia give him a lot of confidence about where he's at right Yeah, that part of camp, that part of that order, that was pretty impressive. Um, again, I've been saying that, you know, quietly, a full year of Chad Green is, it kind of goes under the radar. He's been really, really, really good for his whole career in a really big spot, so um, that was really cool to see, and um, it was pretty good timing. It was, uh, you know, we got some we got some good outings that day between that and then Kev the next day, so it, it was it was good to see that. He was also really strong at the end of last season. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, mean, I think our bullpen was so good last year, it was kind of, you know, kind of the, he got flown under the radar a little bit, but yeah, he was good every single time. There was the one, I think it was Colorado, where a bunch of runs scored in his first outing, and we were winning pretty handily, but other than that, he was pretty much his normal self. Davis will be the first one to tell you he didn't have a great spring. So how much of what he did last season really factored into your decision because you knew what he could do for this club? Yeah, I mean, you're looking at the whole body of work um, with a lot of guys. Some guys, it's performance-driven in camp, but with, with Schneid, you know, he knows what he can do. I think our team knows what he can do, and the league knows what he can do. So it really comes down to... Um, you know, remembering that and then seeing how he fits with the rest of our roster, which is a pretty, pretty damn good fit. All right. Well, we suggested there would be news. There is indeed news. That is John Schneider, was John Schneider, manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, speaking at Tropicana Field. Ross Atkins will address the media.
<coughs> pardon me, Ross Atkins will address the media at 3.30, and uh, we will carry that live as well. We'll get to our picks in a minute. Kevin, just touching on what John Schneider just told the media, Wes Parsons, Nate Pearson, they get the final two spots uh, in the bullpen. Um, clearly some concern, some unknown with Kevin Gossman. John Schneider not ready to commit to Kevin Gossman starting in Houston. We had suggested perhaps you start him in the Bronx against a division Well, opponent. I think I think it's they don't, they don't really know about game four. That's, that's what it is. If he doesn't pitch game four, when will he pitch? Right. And he mentioned about the division opponent. Yeah. Right, so you might... If he doesn't pitch game four, you might skip Houston to come to the Yankees because they were 21 and 31 last year in the division. They can't yeah. make, for me this year, they can't make the playoffs and, if that doesn't get and, better. And, and, and quite frankly, Kevin Gossman and uh, Minute Maid Park, they, uh, they, they don't like each other. They don't like each other. No. So uh, that, was, uh, that was interesting, at least. So nothing definite in Kevin Gossman. Certainly no reason to be concerned right no. now. I think it's just simply a matter of how it falls into place. Um, so therefore Wes Parsons, because I know we were looking at this. Okay. Wes Parsons, Mitch White, uh, aren't they kind of the same thing, but clearly the Jays are worried about innings. So, uh, there you are. Uh, I don't know if this surprises me, I guess not. Uh, it looks very much as if the top four is going to be Springer, Guerrero, Bichette, Justin Turner, um, towards the end of spring training, we saw a bow in the number three spot. And um, you know, Bo has said, just, I, I just want consistency. Bo likes a consistent spot. I'm, I'm okay with it. It just, I'm a little surprised it wasn't something we saw right from the get-go in spring training. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter. But, uh, you know, Kevin, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's how Springer looked in spring training. I think it's how Vladdy looked in spring training. I think how they know Bo will be in the regular season. And then I think they know that Turner can drive right. dudes in. That's You're trying to maximize everybody's talent. You're trying to get the best out of those four dudes you can possibly get to maximize how many wins you have at the end of the season. I love it. And they're not married to it. I, no, I, no, I, that I was... love that, too. They might be married to the, to the one spot and the four spot unless you got, again, against some really good pitching and you want to move Bo to the cleanup spot and you want to move Turner around. Like, you can do some things. I think who's leading off? If he's healthy yeah. and Springer looks like he can pull a fastball, he'll be leading off most of the time. I I know for a fact that Vladdy loves hitting in the two hole. He just feels comfortable there. Like it's you know, and it's that again, breaking up the free swingers. All right. There's a lot a lot of the times there is two pitch, two outs a lot. What does Vladdy do? And I'm not sure mentally Vladdy's capable of doing that. I mean, no offense to Vladdy. I just don't think he is. It's just working the counts and how do you have a quality at bat without getting a hit with two outs already on two pitches. You want to break that up a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that. And, again, it, it gets back to who would you rather have up a lot of the times with dudes on base? Right and now, I think Bo. that, again, a lot of the smart people are telling them, put Bo in that yeah. spot and he'll come up a lot of the times that way, right? It's sort of the three hole, the six hole, and sometimes the cleanup spot, right, depending mm -hmm. on who's where and how many times the guy's getting on base. you got to love that. And uh, with the injuries to Eric Swanson and Jordan Romano, not really any clarification on that yet. I really expect that. I would, I would think we'll probably learn tomorrow that they're both, uh, they're both in the IL. Uh, John Schneider, pretty clear. Jimmy Garcia, who we talked about this yesterday, he second highest velo in camp this year. <clears throat> Jimmy Garcia and Chad Green will handle the uh, the back end of the bullpen. That's experience. That's experience. Yeah, yeah. My guess is Chad Green gets the first shot at it in Tampa. I, I, right, it's well, matchup. Matchup driven. You're, you're right. crazy. You're right. <laughs> you're, like, yeah, you're right. They, you're you know, right. If, if, if two lefties are coming up, you know, you you may want to be careful how you right. use the slider and those kind of things. So I'm sure it'll be matchup driven. All right. Well, it's that time where we drag Kevin Barker off the fence, where he's spent the last two days. Who's the most irreplaceable player in the team? Well, well I, I don't mean, know. The entire make the playoffs, rotation and, 10 the, and, and the, the, the <laughs> back end of the bullpen and the top four, they're all, all irreplaceable. Uh, uh, we're going to force Kevin Barker off the fence. Uh, and we're going to do our picks for the year. Are you ready, Barker? Are you ready? This is, the, this is almost it's like spring not, training. It's the worst time you know of the what? year. It's not. One, it no, really is. One, nobody remembers. Two, it's like sports talk. This is sports talk radio stuff. I take pride in getting it right, though, and most of the time I don't. That irritates me. Fun with it. I, you know, you're you're. I'm in, I'm in on that information yeah. thing, and I don't really have a lot of this. I'm just. All right, are we going to start? Should we start with Kevin's? Or are we going to start with mine? Age before beauty. Age before beauty. Beauty before age. 
Uh, our picks for the American League. We need a drum roll here. I don't really have one. You don't have a drum I roll? Not really. You don't have a drum roll? Not really. Okay. Um, we will do our American League picks then, Mr. Barker. You start with yours. You want me to do all three of them, or you want me to start with the American League East? I do the American League East. Well, I think it's obvious, right? If you don't pick the Orioles, I, I think you might be begging. So there we go. We got I, I, American League East is my pick there. It, you know, and then there's sort of everybody else, and, and everybody else will sort of fill in the blanks. So I got the Orioles winning the American League East. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, you got in the Central. Well, I think you can see it there on the yep. bottom. Well, yeah, obviously people listening can't see the TV, but I have the Twins. Like again, the Central is you know one of the worst divisions in baseball. <laughs> like it, it really is. So if you if you can get some you know some playing time from certain guys with the Twins, you would think because of the way the Twins pitch and and it's just a pedigree there with winning. So I'm picking the Twins. The Astros for me is an easy pick. I, I like the Astros just because they're you know the, the, it's hard to repeat. It's hard to be good back-to-back -back years. You know, that's why the Mariners, a lot of the times, because of their GM, you can't really take them serious all the time. I like the rotation. And, the, and again, the Rangers, it's hard to do yeah. that. So I like the Rangers in the playoffs. I just don't like them winning the division. So I got the Astros. So you got the Yankees, Texas, and Toronto as your wild card. I, I do. I, yeah, absolutely. I got it in that order, too. I got the Yankees, the Rangers, and, and the Jays. Oh. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And it's, you know, again, you, yeah, can, no, you, could, you could pick – Probably five different teams, right? You can pick the Yankees, the Jays, the Rays, the Rangers, and the Mariners. You can throw those five teams against the wall and make an argument for three of the five in any way you want to pick the three. Just so happens I picked those three because I was going to pick the Yankees to win the American League East mm -hmm. but until Gary Cole got hurt. All right. Well, that's all So right. I picked those three teams. All right. Let's see the correct picks. <laughs> let's see my picks. Uh, we're having fun with this. We are? Yeah. Well, I mean, my picks were already up in sports. There they are. Not much of a difference. I got Baltimore winning. I had Baltimore winning the division at the end of last season. So Baltimore, Minnesota, uh, I'm with you on the central. I have Texas. I, Texas has got, I don't, I think Texas is the best lineup in baseball. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping, I've got my fingers crossed. I'm hoping they can keep it together until they get DeGrom and Scherzer back. Um, and my wild card, you know, Yankees, Houston, and Toronto. I just... I just, I'm not certain that there isn't going to be a bit of a drop off between Toronto, between Toronto, Tampa Bay, and Boston. You know me, I like the Rays. I'm Mr. Rays up. I don't know. I just got a feeling this may be the year that the Rays, the Rays are just not capable of, of, of. I was still. I, I think you got to throw them in the mix. I mean, they, they they tend to figure things out, right? They do. Yeah. All right, let's move on to uh, get to the important stuff here for. Kevin Barker, your your picks as to the the playoff, the 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 World Series winners. Oh, you want me to do World Maybe. Series? You want me to do the National League first? Oh, you can do the National League first. Well, you want yeah, me to do the National, National League? Right? That's well, I mean, yeah, obviously the National League West is that's it, it, an easy one. I mean, the Dodgers they spend a bazillion dollars. They just spent uh, ten years, one hundred and forty million dollars for a catcher. I mean, it's like you know they're crapping money in in L.A. So the the Dodgers is the easiest one. The Braves, I mentioned a step back. You know, you could see Olsen not having the year he had last year. Maybe they don't score as many runs. Maybe it opens the door a little bit for the Phillies to win that division. But I still have the Braves. The pitching's really good. Alex seems like he'll do whatever it takes, and they're in the mm -hmm. window, right? They're athletic everywhere. That's a big deal. The NL Central is sort of like the AL Central, right? You can flip it around for certain teams. I mean, you can make an argument, I guess, for the Brewers. I won't because I don't think their pitching's as good. I don't think they're going to score as many runs. The Cardinals got a good lineup. You don't know a, a ton about the rotation. So I'm picking the Cubs. I got the Phillies, the Diamondbacks, and the Padres in the wild card. All right. So Excellent. that's that's my teams to make the playoffs. Let's get to the postseason picks because uh, we're going to get uh, – we got to get out of here and get to Ross. Okay. At 3.30. Uh, who do you have in the World Series? Yeah, it's an easy one for me. It's it's the it's the Phillies and the Astros. I got the Phillies winning the World Series. I, I, I think the Phillies have top three Ooh. best rotation in baseball. I think they have the best uh, bullpen in baseball. And I think they got mojo when it comes to oh, bowing your chest out in playoff time. Like, the moment's not too big for them. And they got a little something to prove after getting beat by the Diamondbacks last year. So I'm picking the Phillies over the Astros. And I think it's going to be a really good uh, World Series. And it's about time the Phillies do something. So I'm picking the Phillies. I got the uh, I got the Astros going to the World Series, but I've I've got I got the Atlanta Braves winning it. Um, because I, I think I picked them last year and they didn't win. I got the Atlanta Braves. I think Atlanta's 
I top, don't know how you pick Atlanta top bottom if they the can't beat the Phillies. Baseball. Top to bottom, I, I think they're the best team in baseball. I've, you know, well, they are during the regular season. Um, it just seems like whenever they meet the Phillies, they're, they're be, not anymore. I think they're going to be better than the than the Dodgers. I'm just, I'm just they're make, the best team in the National League for sure. Be better, I think they're going to be better than the Dodgers. All right, let's quickly go to the individual awards. Kevin, your individual award winners are. Yeah, well, again, we'll go. For, I think we'll go MVPs first. Uh, in, yeah. in the American League, I got Julio Rodriguez. I mean, he's a he's an athletic freak. That that's a big deal, right? Thirty thirty is not the ceiling. Like, they, there's a lot left in the tank, and I think he's got a little bit more to prove. The National League, I got Fernando Tatis Jr. because I got the Padres making the playoffs, and for them to make the playoffs, he's going to have to do something huge. And I think thirty five and fifty. That's thirty five homers and fifty stolen bases. And he might be the best defensive right fielder in baseball. So, I got Fernando Tatis Jr. winning the National League MVP. You got the Cy Young? I do have the Cy Young. Zach Wheeler I have because, obviously, he's going to have to do a lot in the National League. He's really, really good. And Corbin Burns in the the American League just because, you know, to be that number one, to sort of be the bully on the block in the American League, the Orioles have to have a true number one. Corbin Burns gives you length and quantity. Don't come around every day. For me, it's Corbin Burns, the American League. And uh, we have your NL winner as well. You said Zach Wheeler. You obviously, yeah, Zach obviously Wheeler, read I mean, my picks. Yeah. And uh, no, rookie, of the, rookie of the Year. Rookie of the Year in the in the National League, I, I got Langford because of what you mentioned, Wyatt Langford in the American League with the Rangers. They're going to score tons of runs. It's just about can they repeat when it comes to rotation. And, you know, they do have one of the worst bullpens in baseball, but I have Langford. Uh, Yamamoto I have in the National League. I mean, he's surrounded by everything he can possibly be surrounded by, who he's playing for. So if you can't win it, I mean, I ain't no hope for you. So I'm picking that guy. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Yeah. All right, let's roll the mine uh, to my individual picks, which, again, we're up on sportsnet.ca. Uh, my MVP in the American League was Hadley Rushman <laughs> of the Baltimore Hey, I, I go. I as Trevor, Trevor May said, Buster Posey. He's the next Buster Posey offensively. Well, can he hit 40 terrific. homers? You got to ask. You win the MVP, you got to drop 40. Can he hit 40 homers? That, that's the big thing. Uh, I think he's the type of guy that I think a lot of people, there's something about catchers. Catchers having good offensive years. I think a lot of people gravitate to them. I've got him for the AL MVP. Uh, my American League Cy Young Award, and I'm 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 sticking with it, even though we don't know his health status. I think Kevin Gossman wins a Cy Young this year. Mm. I think Kevin Gossman wins a Cy Young. I'm not alone. I get a lot of folks in baseball feel that way as well. Uh, I I just think he's poised to have a to have somebody's really got to be special to your point for the Blue Jays to make I, the playoffs. Why not be I, Kevin Gosman? And of course, as you said yesterday, you agreed with me. He's the most irreplaceable person on the team. Not true. Yeah. There's like it ten of them. Uh, let's go to Rookie of the Year, the American League, um, for uh, Evan Carter at Texas. I went. I wanted to go with Langford, but Evan Carter was good in the postseason last year. How do you? How do you? How do you overlook him? Yeah, I think Langford can hit more homers. That That's the thing, right? He can drive in more runs. He's hitting the middle. Evan Carr's a good pick, too. I mean, he's athletic. He's going to steal tons of bases. He's going to be on base all the time, right? When you're on base all the time, it's okay for you to screw up on the bases. So you're going to take some more chances, take more chances. You steal more bases. Maybe you get more votes. That's yeah. Easy pick. Texas is, I, I think we're on, the, we're on board. With the, the, I, I think Texas is the one team, though, I think Texas can can win another World Series. It's if, hard to repeat. If, if 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 they get those two guys, John back Gray in might some be form. a big deal. John Gray's going to be DeGrom's a huge deal. Grom's going to be a big deal. Yes. Like, hey, what are you going to get from him? Like, you know, Scherzer. What's what's he got? Like, there's some unknowns there, and their bullpen stinks. So, mm. let's see. Yeah, I I have a yeah, I have a fair amount of faith that Chris Young will get uh, will get stuff mm. done. Uh, we heard from John Schneider, made a little bit of news, or firmed up some things that are a little newsworthy. Ross Atkins is the general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays. He is set to address the media in Tropicana Field. Again, the Jays and the Rays will open the season tomorrow at 410. We're going to take a break. Come back. Hear from the general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, Ross Atkins. It's Blair and Barker on Sportsnet 590 The Fan. Sportsnet. All right. Back with the final half hour of Blair and Barker. Sportsnet 590 fan of Sportsnet. A reminder, you can get us uh, via podcast about an hour or so after the uh, conclusion of the show. Tomorrow we'll be on again from 2 to 4. Obviously, that's a regular time slot now. 2 to 4 leading up to the Blue Jays game against the Tampa Bay Rays. The first game of the 2024 championship season. Nice. 6 and 4 start. 
Oh, you look. Oh, yeah, because you don't want to come back five and five. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I can hear the boos at the Rogers Center if the five and five Blue Jays come back. What if they're ooh. four and six? Ten games. Hmm? Ten games. Like okay. we can't. We got to move beyond that. Okay. Short term thinking. Take a longer term view of it, Kevin. Take take take. Take a step back and take a longer-term view of it. Mm. Speaking of a longer-term view, here is the general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, Ross Atkins. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. You're prior to acquiring? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of both, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, it's been uh, a very lengthy process led by Ryan Middleman and Andrew Tennis. Um, Hidi Sato as well has been uh, really, really involved and very helpful in understanding everything we could about the player. Um, the person was... Not as easy to learn as much about for some obvious reasons, but they did an incredible job of getting to know the teammate, the toughness, the resilience, and um, you know the the biggest challenge for us was projecting the starter uh, in him, and his confidence and faith in that was a big part of the equation. His desire to do so and our willingness to explore that was a big part of the acquisition. Right. So I think he also identified with the organization and city um, was really excited about the culture of the team and the and the city and country so he's he's been awesome I think then moving forward to spring training the you know not exactly sure this was a part of your question but a big thing for us is giving him every chance to be a starter um, you know moving forward short term and long term while considering him as a relief option for us uh, currently and in the short term. But the fact he didn't pitch much at all last year is it kind of a, a fine line. We, he'd love to do this and we'd yeah. love to do this, but we don't know if it's the best idea right away. Yeah, I think it'll look a lot like Bowden did last year. Right. So, you know, the, the innings will be controlled early right. so that we're not spending a lot of bullets in AAA, ideally, and hopefully he's a weapon for us here and and a person not just a weapon <laughs> uh, that can contribute to the blue jays as well okay, thank you. yeah ross at this point what do you know about what romano and swanson are dealing with and how long uh, they might take to return? yeah i was with them both this morning they both look great um you know they're they're recovering well they feel strong and barring no setbacks i think this could be a minimal stint uh, a little bit different um, with Swanee because he didn't have as much of a workload built into spring training as as Jordan did, but uh, we're we're hopeful that it could be a very short stint and we could see them certainly within the month. But that's barring no setbacks. And in the bullpen, you're, you're leaning on that depth a little bit now. Rotation with Bowden. What do you feel about the the next wave beyond that and how you're set up if any more is needed? Yeah, it's interesting. Across the game, there's been a lot of pitching injuries, and we've been called a lot on our pitching depth that you know is even in triple a so you know having guys like Hagen danner and zach pop you know in triple a for us obviously the yariel and some of the starting pitchers and ricky tiedemann um chad dallas i'm forgetting someone right now but it is a a strong group that we feel good about can contribute uh, in a significant way for us so um you know Spring training is uh, performance is not something you try to I mean it, it all matters like all information matters and results matter. Uh, but some of the peripherals and some of the things that we're seeing behind the scenes, not just in, um, you know, pure performance, were very encouraging and exciting about all of those guys. Russ, what are uh, those two guys, Romano and Swanson, doing right now? And what is sort of their timeline to, are they long tossing? Do they, yeah. how do they progress to a mound? And that, that sort of rough timeline. Yeah, I mean, it could be pretty quick for Jordan. Uh, as long as he doesn't have setbacks, it could be that he's getting on a mound relatively soon. Um, and Swanee not too far behind. So they are both long tossing and... Um, you know, we'll be careful, but they had done so much work that, um, you know, it, it could be a relatively smooth transition back into the major leagues. They will likely need a couple of outings when facing hitters for sure. Uh, we'll see if they need to pitch in Buffalo. It will really depend on how long that progression is. But 
for now, they're long tossing, and as long as they continue to recover, felt, recover well, the next step will be getting onto a mount. What does the uh, process look like for Joey Votto right now? Where is he at, and how far away is he from baseball activities and potentially some action? I think he's dazed from baseball activities. Um, his, he still feels a little bit of tightness in his ankle, but um, you know, then he'll want to get into uh, essentially having a full spring training and you know, getting that workload built up on his legs and on his swing so that he can recover and bounce back and be ready on a daily basis. What would his progression look like for us? Would he, if once he's ready down in Florida, would he jump right to Buffalo or would he kind of go up to each level? I, I would imagine, you know, we'll work with him on that. That was the discussion that we had. Um, he's uh, obviously extremely open-minded. I'm sure you've all picked up on that from his interactions and, he wants to make sure, most importantly, that he's at an elite level and not just at a level where um, he's participating or contributing. So uh, I think he'll be and we will be very mindful of giving him every chance to do that. So the most likely scenario would be sometime uh, essentially building up a spring training and extended um, and then moving to Buffalo at some point. And we don't he doesn't have a firm timeline on that and you know we'll connect on a weekly basis and obviously we'll connect on a daily basis as an organization but he and schneids and i will connect weekly to see how we can support him and help him what do you expect um, alec manoa's progression and rough timeline to be and really just he's just a little bit behind um i think you could just look at the workload today he threw two innings and he was exceptional his stuff was electric uh, he's moving really well. His mindset's incredible. Um, so, you know, then the next step would be to go three innings and then four, and then you're starting to talk about him being available. So I'm, I know similar to what I was just saying, he's going to want to exhaust that time and make sure he gets the most out of it to make himself a candidate for us. Well, from what you've seen of the offense this spring, what's, what's your level of confidence uh, its ability to produce runs in a, in a better way this season? Yeah, it's been, it's been really encouraging. The early results have been great. The dialogue, the preparation has been consistently um, in a really strong place. And the individualized dialogue, the individualized discussion that Donnie and Guillermo and Matt and Hunter are having with all of our hitters is... Uh, seemingly been very effective and um, you know received really well and then the early results have been very good so um, we obviously believe in this group and are really excited to see what it means in terms of run scoring this year. What are your expectations for this team this year? To compete and uh, you know ultimately to contend for a World Series. Ross, with Vladdy, is, is there anything specific that you can point to that gives you the most optimism or something you see that's different this year or improved? Uh, you know, I mean, I think the biggest thing with Vladdy is his track record and his history of having such a knack to um, make el have elite contact and hit the ball very hard. So we've continued to see that his whole career and are really encouraged by his at-bats in spring training. Um, you know, everything about his peripherals were really exciting. So I think the most the most encouraging thing is the things that he's feeling and saying and articulating. And that's not a Ricky Tiedemann clip as well. Uh, what, how do you balance, like, last few stages of development and contributing here? Like, what's that timeline look like? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, he's, you know, it's still early in his career. I mean, he clearly uh, can handle a lot and... Uh, it's exciting to think about him contributing at this level, and I'm certain he will. Um, but you know, it's still there's still an opportunity for him to, um, you know, with his skill set to dominate and to dominate AAA hitters. And we don't need to see that for him to be someone that's coming here. But I think getting to a level where you know his fastball command and then the slider usage and changeup usage are at levels that. You know, he can do different things to different lineups uh, because he has so much potential that it's really important for us to, uh, you know, help him maximize that time down there. Well, so how did the guardrails on his workload this season uh, impact how you may want to use him here? Like, if he came here, would you consider him for different roles or does he need to be in every fifth day so he can continue his progression as a starter? How do you look at 
um, the, the kind of the plan for him and his relative to his usage and contrib potential contributions here? Yeah, I mean, as a starter. So we're just viewing him as a starter. That we would never eliminate anything. That if we had the need and there was a certain point in the season where it didn't negatively impact long term him being a starter, certainly could consider that. But he'll be on a regular starting turn, um, and we're not concerned about the workload this year. So even though he's kind of been like he could go wire to wire and not have to be protected very much. You know, I mean, you always um, you want to be mindful of how big increases are. But as we've talked about a lot over the, our time here, every individual is different. Every uh, time of the season, every you know aspect of their development and their path is different. So we just want to use all the information, not just the guardrails that. You know, we will have we will have some thresholds that are more important than others, um, but I think it's uh, you know in, in our in our opinion just putting a firm end based on seat on based on innings is is there's a better way to handle that um, you know how the what the what the stress was on the innings what the number of pitches were how he's recovering each outing what the trend is with all of his stuff so. We'll use all that information to make sure he's in a safe place. Well, she mentioned your expectation for the team is to compete. How is it better equipped to do so than last year? Yeah, I mean, all the things we've talked about this offseason several times at the start, during the middle of the offseason, um, you know, a month ago, it's uh, the the continued growth of the group here, our belief in the in the group here, things that we've added to this team, really excited about the additions of uh, Justin Turner and bringing KK back, IKF, having a full season of Chad Green. Um, you know, really excited about the progress of Alec Manoa, getting, um, you know, the bringing Yimmy Garcia back uh, on a on a club option. So, a lot has transpired to keep this group together, continue to complement it that we feel very very strong about. There you go, Ross Atkins, general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays. So. Um, obviously Romano and, uh, as Shai Davidi tweeted out, Romano and Eric Swanson will go to the IL. Uh, Kevin Gossamer, we're kind of waiting on. Um, Alec Manoa through today. Um, the next step, according to Ross Atkins, get him to pitch three innings, four innings. I don't know. Uh, the, the Joey Votto stuff I found puzzling. Yeah. Uh, Ross Atkins saying that Joey Votto needs a full spring training and then they will go from there. Does that mean that he needs three weeks or a month? I was hoping. Not. I don't know. But uh, I do. I The one thing Ross said, and I, I went back and looked, is something that Joey Votto said. Joey, Joey Votto did say when he came here, he said, you know, I, I'm coming here to be elite. I, I'm not coming here to be... I don't think Joey Votto plans on being a guy who's going to hit 205 with three home runs. And I think Joey Votto wants to get himself in a position where he can come up and contribute. I get that. And Romano and, and Swanson, I just, I, you know, I, puzzling there. Um, yeah, the Swanson thing's not. I mean, he didn't have a spring training, really. He, I mean, with, no, with, with but my, family my point things is, that were going on, but my point that is, makes sense. But my point is, a couple of days ago, we were told that he was actually closer to being able to ramp up than Jordan Romano. I mean, I, I just guess we'll, ha we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see with those guys. I mean, that's the, that's probably the obvious guys. answer that you're supposed to give when you're a GM is, is there's some unknowns there. You don't want to back yourself into a corner and say no, something that's not going to take place, right? You don't want to get fans' hopes up. And yeah. it's just better to say with what – how did you put it? The month, within the month? Within a month, I thought. Yeah, said. that's a long time. I mean, if, if, it's a, if, they're, if they're gone for the entire month of April – that's going to be hard to make up for. Uh, like, there's only so many Wes Parsons and Mitch Whites and and all the Apparently plethora. Not. Apparently, of there's other... a ton of Wes Parsons and Mitch Whites out there. Because, well, I mean, I know Jay one's still in the curveball grip off the other one, and and maybe they're going to be better, and it's going to work out. And they're going to give everybody three innings, and uh, yeah, look, this just brings it full circle right back around to the offense. It really does. Like, it, when you're basically the reason why they made the playoffs last year was because of their pitching. 
and defense. Now, now, now it's what well, it goes hand in hand, right? You know, you you strike out enough, you make enough good quality pitches, you get enough weak contact. That makes it easier for the khakis to put you in the right spot. You're catching the balls a little easier. So now it's time for the offense to to catch up and and make some adjustments and sort of carry this team the first week of the season or first month of the season. So yeah, it's I think he said exactly what most GMs would say. You know, it's I think we sort of already knew. I mean, that was that was the word when I was down there about Alec Manoa is I, I will say this. We we make fun and poke fun about I was the I'm in the best shape of my career. He in was in the he best was. shape. He was in good shape. Like it was unbelievable. Like yeah. it is he is done things in the off season to make himself a better pitcher and, and hopefully he can come because they're a better team with him starting so they can use other guys in positions to not have to, you know, force it, I guess, calling guys up from AAA that you really don't want to make a lot of outings. And, and hopefully they can do that and come and throw a lot of strikes and get a lot of people out. Yeah, it does appear as if, uh, you know, I mean, kind of the, the, the takeaway from today's media availability, both with John Schneider and, 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 um, and Ross Atkins is, is just me. I feel... Get more hits. More uncertainty now. What'd you say? Get a lot of hits. No, I said... I, <laughs> that's what I took away. Yeah. That, <laughs> get that's get a lot extent. of hits. I feel more uncertainty about the bullpen now than I did going into the day. Uh, yeah. Like, I just assumed one of those two guys would be back. Well, that's point. why Wes Parsons is here. So do they. Like, it's about the yeah. innings. Where are the innings coming from? They're, they don't feel... Again, they're the oldest rotation in the American League East. Like, they're, the innings early on, they got to be real careful. Because they I want the best out of those dudes at the end yeah. of the season or the middle of the season when they're really and trying to get hot and heavy and make a run at it. So, yeah, it makes sense. I, guess. I, I wouldn't put – I wouldn't read too big a deal into the fact that we we don't really know when Kevin Gossman is starting yet. I think that's just um, – I've said I've kind of thought all along – you said this a couple of weeks ago when he first went was hurt. Said you probably start him in the Bronx. Just give him as much time as you want. He's facing a division opponent. He doesn't yeah. doesn't pitch well against. The, I think it's in, the I, I think it's interesting too to hear John say you don't want too much time off. Right, the heart rates up. The right, right. the momentum of you know how you feel is raring and ready to go now. Well, it's he hasn't just, had a regular spring, so you don't want to. Well, I don't, don't know if he even to, needs it. I mean, he's a veteran guy. Maybe this little hiccup will help him getting the best out of him longer. I mean, he's he's thrown a ton. Yeah, he's older and he's got two pitches. Like, there's a lot goes into him trying to get people out, and maybe this little setback will help him just get the best out of him to give him a little bit more of a breather. And they're trying to get their best four guys against the division more times than not. I think you can look at it that way. Yeah. I, I also think that the news on Joey Votto explains why Daniel Vogelback is on this team as opposed to somebody like Nathan Lucas is they, they need they need a power bat off the bench. Well, he's a power threat. Off the, right? off the bench. I, he's a threat. I, I think, too, if Joey hadn't have gotten hurt, he's making the team. Like I, I think they like this at bats enough to, to think that he can give a Joey – Votto at bat with a dude standing at second. Like they, that's a that's a big deal for them. It's mm-hmm. not so much a hit in the homer. You know, Vogelbach gives a, a threat of the long ball. Yeah. Is he going to give you a quality of bat? I mean, don't like the breaking ball. Like it's, and I'm not saying he's an easy out because he's a big time threat, got tons of power. But who would you rather have up in a big moment? Two outs in the eighth inning facing an elite right handed pitcher. Yeah. That's that I think is what they're trying to push for. And I mean, this. Entire spring training remark. I thought that's a long time. I mean, how many at bats do you need? You don't know yourself by now. I mean, I well, look. Yeah, I get that you're trying to but see I the best of, of Joey Votto, but man, like I, I think you're under. I, I think you're underestimating the extent of his injuries, especially the injury last year. That like, doesn't surprise me. Oh, well, when I, I talked not, to him I, in spring training, he he didn't seem like he was worried about any of that. It's about well, getting yeah, at well, bats and and he's Joey Votto. He's not going to come out and tell you, Kevin. I don't I've know if I got. Joey, I don't know if I've, I got anything I've left know, in the tank. I've known Joey for a long time. It's not about having anything in the tank. It's about being healthy. And when I was talking to him, he told me he was a hundred percent. And then he hurts his ankle, and that's. You know, I mean, that's some bad luck. I I, I got to be honest with you, I've never heard anybody stepping on a bat, in a, and especially in in the oh. big leagues. Everybody keeps their bats like it's that's how you make your well, money. I don't know. I, Who's I've, bats laying in the in the dugout? I have I that I don't get. I've, I mean, Michael Barrett almost ended his career running into uh, going after a ball in, uh, in the on deck circle, and there was a donut there and a yeah. bat there. Well, that's I can different. see that. That's, yeah, yeah. That, that's a field yeah. of play. Yeah. I'm with you. I still yeah. You know, you're not going to make. Bad look you're well. not going to make a big. You're not going to make a big deal uh, out of it, but I just saw the same thing you did. I'm going, who the hell left their bat line in a in, in 
the freaking angle yeah, nothing, of the dugout that, that Joey against, Votto's going to roll nothing over Nothing against Vogel Buck, but it's, I think they feel more comfortable, and John would feel more comfortable calling on Joey to have that big time at bat against a tough righty than Vogel Buck. That's just the way it's sort of playing out, right? I think they like their bench for the mm-hmm. most part, right? They got a power left. They got a power righty. They got a contact guy. They haven't had that in a while. I think it's that they've, they've taken the best athletes to the season. Yeah. I think you can argue that right now. No, I, I think if you, going back to John Schneider's interview with us, where he talked about, I asked him about spring training and putting your bench together. How much of it is taking the guys that are going the best or how much of it is you've got to have guys who give you different things. And he talked about you want a little speed, you want contact ability, which Ernie Ernie Clement gives him contact ability. You want some power off the bench and you want guys who are able to play multiple positions, which, you know, they they have with with, with Ernie Clement and and to a certain degree, David Schneider. Exactly. Impactful plug and play. I, and, and a I guy, you don't, and like a guy you don't have to worry about. You don't have to ask him every day, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? The guy that, well, them three dudes better be good every time you yeah. ask him that. <laughs> well, no, you, well, if not, they ain't going to be there. You want, it's real simple. You want to know that if you, if Ernie, been Cle- if, the, if Ernie Clement hasn't played for two days, that he's going to be ready I'm, to go. In I've been one days. of those guys. Even if you don't feel right, you tell him, I ain't never felt better, coach. I'm gummy. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't never felt better. It's the best I ever felt. What do you think a guy like Ernie Clement is thinking today? He has made opening days. He's he's had a good spring. Yeah, oh, he's earned it. The organization. Yeah. The you know what? I'm not surprised because I thought at the end of last year, I, I mean, he would if you had said at the end of last year to me, okay, give me your 25 man roster for for opening day in 2024. Obviously, they're going to be there are going to be pickups and acquisitions and everything like that and deletions. But Ernie would have been in my roster at the end of the year. I would have said, yeah, I can see it. There's a real chance where this guy is. On yeah, I've liked him forever. Roster. I've liked him ever since, would... since the first time I've seen him. I liked him. He's got baseball IQ, which is a big deal. On a championship team, you've you got to be able to Easily go... maintain swing, yeah, as yeah, you it's, I mean, out, it's, right? it's a flat swing. Like, there's not a lot of moving parts to it. He's got an idea how to get the barrel of the baseball after sitting over there for three days. That's a big thing, right? And especially with the velocity that you have now, you got to be short and quick to the ball. Mm-hmm. It's not a lot to maintain between the times you're playing so it gives john a lot of options and that's a, that's never a bad thing i don't think john can go wrong now whoever he goes to over there i don't think people can argue and yell about it i think that's what you want on a good team oh let's uh cover up a couple of things that uh kind of escaped us today first of all the baltimore orioles have been sold that was official made official today a uh, unanimous vote which those things usually are. So the Baltimore Orioles are owned by uh, David Rubenstein. Mm. And um, the L.A. Dodgers, according to Jeff Passan, are close to a uh, 10-year, $140 million <laughs> deal with Will Smith. Well, I mean, I'm not allowed. Will Smith is, Will Smith is nah, pretty good. He's a good player. Is he a $140 million player? That's, he, a, that's a lot of money. Well, that's $14 million a year. Is he a $14 million a year player? It's yeah. $140 million. That's a lot. I mean, I know the years makes it sound like it's only $14 million a year, Dodgers, which it is. But it's Dodgers it's money. Well, I know. It's Dodgers money. They got a room. Yeah. Appar- <laughs> apparently, he gets his own interpreter with it, too. So, there you go. Uh, so, Will, Will Smith. Uh, I need an interpreter. Yeah. <laughs> Will Smith has, uh, has uh, is close Gotten to something. Paid. And uh, the Rays made a little deal, uh, a three-way deal. They get catcher Ben Rodford, and uh, John Birdie is off to the New York Yankees. Yep. So that is, uh, and I'm just, I'm just scrolling through here. The Rays have made a couple other moves, uh, much like the case with John Schneider. Kevin Cash is uh, talking to his reporters and finalizing their roster. So uh, yeah, that's it. One more sleep nice. tomorrow. Can't opening wait. day. I can't wait. Two to four tomorrow. Don't forget, four o'clock first pitch on Sportsnet 590, the fan and Sportsnet. I'm looking forward to this. Me too. I can't wait. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.